right, welcome everyone to the Rose Card podcast. I'm joined by Mike. How are you, Mike? Dan, hey, how's it going? Uh, I'm very good. Sort of enjoying the fact that markets are getting a bit more volatile. We've had this strange rally in January. I suppose it wasn't strange in that you typically get one in January. We had a, a, an uptick in liquidity conditions from China, but it wasn't a quality rally. And in, in fact, it, it was really a rally led by the, the stocks, the, the indices that had fallen most last year, um, rallied the most. And, and many of those, again, uh, were these meme stocks, you know, no no profits, no strong cash flow, but uh, kind of speculative instruments. And I think what is now dawning on investors and certainly dawning on central bankers is that inflation is here to stay and it will require uh, more restrictive monetary policy to, to bring it down to central bank target levels. Yeah, the uh, let's, let's pick up on the point about the meme stocks taking off again. It's been a while since we've seen, had a year where we've seen the January effect. Uh, and this refers to the habit of US investors to do some tax loss harvesting in December, wait 30 days and then buy those stocks back. And the last time we really saw this sort of behavior was in 2001. So January 2001, you had the dot-com bust the previous year. And then in that January, the, uh, the stocks all had a big bounce and our stack was up a lot. And it's very similar this time around. Uh, and as a reminder, 2001 wasn't a great year overall for markets. It was just a good January. Uh, so we've seen that happening. Uh, and as you say, some of the meme stocks, I think it was, was it Bed Bath & Beyond who defaulted on a bond and the equity went up a lot? It's uh, it's odd behavior. It's very strange. And yeah, there, was, there were a few, I think there were a few earnings calls with these companies. And I think the more they danced with bankruptcy, uh, the more the stocks rallied. So again, it, it, that that just tells us that January was a very speculative period, and this is now beginning to wash out of the market. And I think as we focus again on inflation, central banks, a lot of things to talk about the dollar potential, dollar strength, short-term rates in the U.S. I think being more attractive now to investors and giving them somewhere else to go apart from equities. And of course, then you and I are watching the the Bank of Japan, and they have this yield curve control policy in place, which I think begins to look quite vulnerable. Yes, they they caught everyone by surprise in December by raising the uh, yield rate target on their ten year bonds from zero point two five to zero point five percent, and I think everyone expected it to happen at some point, but uh, they they came out of the blue and, and did it in December. And the new head of that bank will be starting in the next couple of months. So he might want to make other changes. And uh, we were talking just before we started recording. When the Bank of Japan raises the level of yield they target on their bonds, it kind of drags up everybody else's bond yield as well. And as a reminder, rising bond yields mean falling bond prices because you have that inverse relationship. And uh, if bond prices are falling at the same time that stock markets are falling, then what was traditionally a diversified portfolio really struggles. And that's why you know you want to hold cash instead of bonds if you're looking for defensiveness in this environment. Yeah, exactly. And I think I think uh, that in a way it's a logical event to happen in that pretty much all the central banks have reacted to inflation by aggressively changing tack. And the Bank of Japan is the one that hasn't really followed suit. And, you know, as you say, wage inflation in Japan is picking up and it will have a big effect because Japanese investors are, if you like, the sort of the anchor of the fixed income world. And if the Bank of Japan was to move, that would remove a big source of demand for bonds worldwide and yields uh, would, would push up. And I guess that informs how we're positioned. We're still quite cautiously positioned and I'm, I'm quite happy with that at the moment. Yeah, we've still got that high percentage in cash, uh, which gives us optionality to buy risk assets when the time is right. We also have a hedge within the uh, sterling portfolios in terms of currencies. Uh, so we have part of the cash is in the US dollar. And that really is just in case the dollar starts to move upwards as it is right now. And that causes problems around the world. And it's difficult to forecast currencies. But it's easy to see how it could happen because a lot of the world is on floating rate mortgages. So in the UK, for example, 
it's often the case that someone has a two or three year fixed rate mortgage. And that means as they reset at higher interest rates, it gets more difficult for someone like the Bank of England to keep on raising rates. Whereas in the US, the fixed rate mortgages that they have mean it takes a little longer for interest rate hikes to go through. Overall, this means the Fed can raise rates for longer than everyone else, potentially in which case the dollar gets more strength again. Yeah, exactly. And um, I guess to close out to what we're watching for in the next month is central bankers to become more gloomy, more hawkish, talk about rates being higher for longer, no rate cuts this year. And this, we think, will, will induce more volatility, more moves to the downside for equities. Uh, we have lots of cash, so we're always ready to deploy that, but not yet, I think. Yeah, exactly that. Well summarised. Thank you, Mike. I look forward to chatting in the near future. Okay, then. Take care. Bye.